morning. If you have a worship folder, we have a, just a few announcements. I'm not going to cover everything in there, or I might. Uh, the first thing I want to say is VBS planning meeting and potluck lunch and canvassing after church today. So, immediately after service, there will be a potluck lunch in Fellowship Hall and a VBS planning meeting. And so if you plan on being part of VBS and you want to come for, to that, there's plenty of food if you didn't bring anything. Uh, so show up for that. And then after the meeting and after lunch, we're going to go hit the neighborhood, pass out some flyers, inviting our neighbors to VBS this summer. I'm excited about VBS because um, it's a theme, like archaeology type theme, and it's like destination dig. And I'm bringing in about a ton of sand to put on the stage. That sound fun? Okay, maybe not. Uh, I can just see the cleaning crew come in and they have all the sand to clean up. Anyway, it's going to be fun. I'm excited about VBS this year. Uh, ladies Bible study is going on. See Ginger if you need more details about that. And then our camp, children's camp silent bake auction is coming May 2nd. And muffins with mom on Mother's Day, May 9th. If you would look in your worship folder and you see this... It says that we are having a reception. The Shady Grove Baptist Church Youth Pastor Search Committee invites you to welcome Nick and Michelle Alvarez. Nick has accepted the position of Youth Pastor, Youth Director at Shady Grove Baptist Church. So we hired Nick Alvarez this week. He will be with us this Wednesday with the youth, and then next Sunday will be his first Sunday with us. So I hope you'll be here to meet Nick and his wife, Michelle. They have been in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, well, she's been her her whole life. Nick uh, originally is from California, I believe. We have a deal with California youth pastors. Anyway, uh, so Nick and Michelle will be here uh, next Sunday, and immediately after worship, we will have a reception for them in Fellowship Hall. So make sure you can stay for that. It's just going to be uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes. It will meet and greet them and make them feel welcome. Uh, Nick is a neat guy. Uh, very, very personable, uh, very down to earth. Uh, I think you're going to fall in love with him. Uh, he's a, just a good guy. Uh, we're excited that God has led them to us. So, this morning, do you know why we're here? We are here to exalt the name of Jesus. And to help us do that this morning, our children's choir is going to come. And they're going to bless us. So y'all bring them kills down here.
before Clay comes to sing, would you pray with me? Father God, as uh, we hear such beautiful music singing from these kids and the words that they sing, so powerful. God, may we sing with the same conviction, the same joy uh, that the kids have. They sing because they want to sing for you, because they love you. God, when we sing to you, we need to understand that it is to you. It's a worship. It's, it's the expression of our love, of our heart to you. It doesn't matter what the person next to us thinks about our singing and about our voice. It's a love we're sharing with you. God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to move in this place as we exalt the name of Jesus, as we lift his name. May you be glorified and honored. God, as we share our, our prayers with you, as we share our love with each other, may it move heaven. God, we ask for your filling of this place, of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone. It's great to see you all here this morning. It's always wonderful to have the kids start the service off and make us sound bad. That's, that's wonderful. All right, y'all. Stand with me, if you would, please, and let's sing a great hymn. Hymn 112, Give to Our God Immortal Praise. Stand with me, please. I 
and glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise Blessed Redeemer, heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. All right, powerful stuff, y'all. You can be seated. Thanks. Good morning, kids. Hey, y'all did such a great job. We should start a praise team. What do you think, Clay? With just kids? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> Can anybody play tambourine? It's not that hard. Okay, maybe not. Triangle? Mouth harp? You... Do you know what those are? Oh, okay, well, don't worry about it. Hey, guys. Danny, what are you doing back there? You don't like me anymore? Oh, okay, he said there's no room up here. Hey, Danny. <clears throat> you like Star Wars? Are you, do you know anything about Star Wars? How about... If I was to tell you some Star Wars trivia, would you tell me if I'm telling the truth or not? Okay, Luke Skywalker was the most powerful Sith. Luke? That dude was the most powerful Sith of all the Siths in the world. What do you mean it's not true? It's false? How do you know it's false? What? You've seen the movie. Have you read the book? Don't worry, I haven't read. I probably nobody in here has read the book. We've all who's read the book? Jake's sake. I read the book. Okay. Hey guys, y'all listen. In life, people might try to tell you things that are not true, even about the Bible. They'll try to tell you something about God, about Jesus, that just flat isn't true. The Thessalonians, somebody had come into their church, the First Baptist Church of Thessalonica there, anyway, and was trying to tell them some things that were not true. And Paul writes them a letter to try and correct some of these things, and he says this in verse 3 of chapter 2, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Now, the way that they kept from being deceived. Y'all know what deceived means, right? Somebody tells you something that's not true and then you believe it. The way to keep from doing that 
is to know what the Bible says. Look, Danny, he knows Star Wars because he's watched the movie probably a million times, right? Yeah, close to it. I've, your brother? Oh, there he is. Hey, so. Uh, okay. So, to, when you learn something about Scripture and you know what Scripture says, then it's going to be hard for somebody to teach you something that's wrong. And how do you know what the Bible says? Reading it. Reading it. That's absolutely right. And say, come to a wana. Come to and come to Awana, and somebody said, "Come to Sunday school." Go to Sunday school. Mark, she's she's sharp, dude. She's on top of it. That's right. Read your Bible. Go to Awana. Go to Sunday school. Memorize God's word. Know what it says about God, about Jesus, about those things that you need to know. And when you know it, and somebody tries to teach you something that's wrong, you'll know the truth. All right, guys. Thank you for paying attention. Hey, Joshua, how's it going? It's good to see you, buddy. All right, you guys are dismissed. Y'all go with Miss Jeanette. If you would stand with me, open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 18. If you don't happen to have a Bible, the verses that we're going to read will be on the screen behind me. Proverbs chapter 18. One who isolates himself pursues selfish desires, who rebels against all sound judgment. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only wants to show off his opinions. When a wicked man comes, contempt also does, and along with dishonor, disgrace. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters, a flowing river, a fountain of wisdom. It is not good to show partiality to the guilty by perverting the justice due the innocent. A fool's lips lead to strife, and his mouth provokes a beating. A fool's mouth is his devastation, and his lips are a trap for his life. The gossip's words are like a choice food that goes down to one's innermost being. The one who is truly lazy in his work is a brother to a vandal. The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are protected. A rich man's wealth is his fortified city. In the, his imagination, it is like a high wall. Before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. The one who gives an answer before he listens, this is a foolish, is foolishness and disgrace for him. A man's spirit can endure sickness, but who can survive a broken spirit? The mind of the discerning acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks it. A gift opens doors for a man and brings him before the great. The first to state his case seems right until another comes and cross-examines him, casting the lot in squirrels and separates powerful opponents. An offended brother is harder to reach than a fortified city, and quarrels are like the bars of a fortress. From the fruit of his mouth a man's stomach is satisfied. He is filled with the product of his lips. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. A man who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. The poor man pleads, but the rich one answers roughly. A man with many friends may be harmed, but there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. sing some more. Our next hymn is going to be hymn 500. Saved, saved. It's a good one.
by. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved, saved, saved. Oh, that's a good one. All right, now let's turn to him nine. Glorify thy name. Let's get our hearts ready for our upcoming message. see in your order of worship if you are a guest or you're new here that we have what we call prayer time or individual prayer and it's simply this we pray and we pray for each other for the person on your left and on your right behind you in front of you cat a corner to you just pray for somebody sitting near you. you you may not know them you may not know their needs their life God does and when you pray for that person, he listens. This morning, if you feel led to come to this old-fashioned altar and kneel and pray here, by all means, it's between you and God. But if you want to sit, stand, kneel where you are, that also is between you and God. So whatever posture you take outwardly, God's okay with it. So let's go to the Father and just spend a few minutes with him in prayer.
as we come before your throne, your children are united in prayer. We glorify you. God, we want to exalt your name, lift you high, because no one else is worthy of our praise, of our adoration, of our love. And God, we can only love you because you first loved us, because you enabled us to love you. God, I pray that this morning, as there are people in our church who are hurting emotionally, even physically, we pray for healing. And God, we have seen answered prayers for healing, and we, we praise you for that. And we give you the glory, and may that be a testimony about your answered prayer. But God, there are others who are still waiting for healing. And sometimes we know that you're in the waiting. That you're teaching us, growing us, helping us to become more like Christ, more dependent on you. It's not always easy, it's not always fun, but it's what's best. God, as we worship you this morning, as we get into your word, I pray that you would touch our hearts. Help us to leave here knowing that we've been in your presence. Help us to leave here knowing that we've been loved. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, this morning, if you would, turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians. We are in week number two, session number two of our sermon series through 2 Thessalonians. And I'm, I'm really, I'm shocked, Dr. Patterson, that the church is not full this morning. Because, I mean, who doesn't want to go through a four-week sermon series in 2 Thessalonians? I mean, I, I should have explained better that we're preaching on the judgment of God this morning, because certainly you would have invited all your friends to hear about the judgment of God, right? I, who doesn't want to hear that? I know you're, some of you are like, well, I certainly don't, because you're probably talking to me. But that's only from this section on the back row in the far left corner. Um, I'm kidding. Russell's not here, so I have to pick on you. Okay. This morning, uh, let me ask you, if you had these parents, or maybe you are these parents, who, when your children are not acting the way that you raised them, trained them, taught them to act, they're acting the way that your in-laws family act, right? And so you warn them that impending doom is, is coming. Uh, you warn them that your wrath is soon to be upon them if they don't change their evil and wicked ways. And some parents will count. And they'll say, one, two, three, and then they get to three and it's just the wrath comes down on the children, right? And, and of course, sometimes the one, two, three is one, two, three, I'm just done with you, and sometimes it's spread out over an hour or whatever, however long it takes you. Some of you are, don't raise your hands, some of you are that, are that parent, some of you had those parents, I had those parents who mom would count and of course, you know, the kids are going to act up all the way until that starts coming out of your mouth and then they're perfect little angels, right? And they're, they're, I stopped, mom, I stopped. I was the, am the parent who, well, no, not, when the kids were little, I would start counting, but the one, I started counting from one, one, two, and three, because one was how many times an object is going to be placed upon your backside. And so each time I had to count, it's like you're getting one pop, two pops, right? So it wasn't counting down. Well, Scripture... Prophecy, more specifically, is God's warning that this impending judgment is coming. We don't always like to hear that, but it's the truth. Now understand, and, and Paul spoke about this, I think it was last week, that judgment isn't always bad. 
I mentioned how my kids have been in band and have put art displays and art shows and of course those you're judged right but generally when you're judged you have some good feedback and you may get a reward for it everyone will be judged and one day when Christians are judged yes we can receive a reward so when Paul in the first part of this book talks about Christians facing judgment part of that is a good judgment but in the section section here as Paul is talking about judgment he's talking about the day of the Lord and it's not going to be something good now this is probably not something popular to talk about in church today. It's not something that we all want to hear, but it's something that we absolutely need to hear. We need to know that a day is coming that God's judgment will be on this world. So as Paul is writing to this, let me tell you what happened. Is We know in 1 Thessalonians, the Christians seemed to believe that Christ had already come, raptured his church out of the world, and they were like somehow left behind. And so Paul wrote to them to kind of correct that. Well, somebody was teaching them, or they just misunderstood, and they believed that they were living in the day of the Lord. And that day of the Lord is this time period of God's judgment. Some people refer to it as tribulation, whatever. It's this judgment of God on the world for their sins, for rejecting Him. And so Paul writes to the Thessalonians to try to explain that God has this timeline. God has this timetable for the order of events for basically the end times. Now, we've talked about this. The next event in God's timetable is the rapture. There's no prophecy. And there's no big events. There's nothing else that has to take place in prophetic uh, timeline before the rapture. It could come at any moment. Any time. But... God has told us, look, guys, here's what's going to happen before it's too late. Now, when you get into that whole tribulation period and there's the debate, can people get saved? Will people, can people not get saved? And we'll kind of touch on that a little bit. But let me tell you, when Paul is writing to them, he wants them to understand that there's this timeline. They need to understand this timeline because basically it's a warning. Number one... It's a warning to live your life in a way that you believe that the rapture, that Jesus is coming, is imminent. That it, it could be any moment. Number two, if you haven't been saved, you might want to consider it. Because the things that come after the rapture are not good. It's going to be evil and atrocities like this world has never seen. And we've seen some bad things happen, even in our lifetimes. Number three... Those people that you know who are not saved, who are not Christians, don't have that faith, that belief in Christ, don't have a relationship with Him, you need to tell them. Because He's explaining to us, look, these bad things are going to happen. My uncle used to avoid getting in fights in high school by explaining to the other person what he's about to do to them. And they're usually like, okay, well, you know, don't want any part of that. And so he was able to avoid these fights. Well, God is explaining, this is what's going to happen after I rapture my church out of this world. You don't want any part of it. You don't want anyone you love, anyone you know, to be a part of it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there's three events in this timeline that we're going to cover. And I mean, we're just, this is really not a, a real in depth study. It's just a kind of an overview of these are the three things we need to know that are going to be like kind of the next three events in the timeline. Number one is the rapture of the church. Look at verse one in chapter two. It says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. We'll stop right there. What he's saying is that gathered to him, the coming of our Lord. Now, we have to differentiate because as Southern Baptists, we tend to believe that the, there's a difference between the rapture and his second coming. And we'll get to the second coming in a second. The rapture is when Jesus comes in the clouds, takes his church out of here. And all the Christians who have lived and died, and all the Christians who are alive are taken up in the clouds in the air, and boom, we're gone. 
And Paul is saying, listen, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered together, gathered with Him. He's talking about the church, the Christians being gathered with Him in the air and going back, going off. That's the rapture. And then if you look in verses 6 and 7, it kind of talks about this briefly. It says, And you know what currently restrains him so that we will be revealed, so that he will be revealed in this time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. What this is referring to is when the church is raptured out. Look, let me kind of back up a little bit. When the church is raptured out, the Antichrist comes to power. And we're going to talk about him in a second. When the Antichrist comes to power, bad things happen. Now understand that that person, and it's a human, who is basically a tool of Satan, possessed by the devil, this person, whoever the Antichrist is, could be alive right now. It could be a, someone who is alive. We don't know. It could be someone who's not been born yet. But the thing, when that person, that Antichrist, is alive, when they're alive, the thing that's restraining them from being as evil as they will be during that seven-year tri tribulation, that day of the Lord, the thing that restrains them is God's Holy Spirit in this world. And that's what Paul is alluding to in this passage, 6 and, six and 7, is that the evil one is... We're not seeing the full force of his evil. We're not seeing all of that because of the good of God's Holy Spirit through the church in this world. But what happens when the church is removed from this situation? When you remove God's Holy Spirit, which is indwelling us from this world, that doesn't mean God's not here. No. God's everywhere. He's omnipresent. But when you remove God's good from this world, meaning the church, the Holy Spirit working through us, you remove that, take it out of the situation, out of the, out of the equation, then the, Holy, the, the, the Antichrist is free to be as ugly and as mean and as terrible as he wants to be. So Paul is referring to that in verse 6 and 7. He's like, look, as long as the church is here, you ain't going to see true evil in its ugliest form because the Holy Spirit is restraining him. Look, when you remove good from an equation, bad does bad things. You can quote me on that. That's a good quote, right? Okay. So the first thing I want you to see is that the church is gathered. We raptured out of here. Before that happens, evil's being restrained. And so the first thing Paul says is, look, the church has to be raptured. Then he says in verses five through, uh, 3 through 5 that there's this revelation of the Antichrist. Look with me at verse 5 through 7. I'm sorry, 3 through 5, I can't even read. Um, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will come will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. He's talking about the Antichrist. The son of destruction, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he sits in God's sanctuary, publicizing that he is, that he himself is God. Don't you remember what that when I was still with you, I told you about this? And then look at the very first part of verse eight. He says, "And then the lawless one will be revealed. Lawless one will be revealed." So there's this revelation of the Antichrist. So once the church is raptured out of here, remember he's given this time frame, this timeline. He says, "Once the church is raptured, the Antichrist will be revealed." Now remember, the people who are left here are people who have rejected God, rejected the Bible, and this is where let's talk real quick about can you get saved during the rapture? Because people have asked me that. In fact, not too long ago, in the past month or so, somebody stood back there and said, can people get saved during the tribulation period? And I think yes. Someone, some people believe that if you have heard the gospel before the rapture, then you have no hope of getting saved after, after the rapture. I have a problem with that because if that was the case, well, let's just don't tell anybody. And then let everybody get saved after, Right? Because the good news is good news, and it's available and will be available. The problem is that once you get saved during that seven-year tribulation, that day of the Lord period, life is going to get worse for you. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be unspeakable atrocities towards believers in that time frame. It's going to be very unpleasant. 
So the I can't think of his name, General Zhao or something like that, the guy that wrote The Art of War, says, know your enemies. Paul, God, throughout Scripture, gives glimpses of the Antichrist. I believe he gives these glimpses of the Antichrist so that the church will know what he's going to look like. Because look, there's going to be people saved in that tribulation period. They need to know who they're facing, what he's like, who he is. There's, so God gives these signs, these evidences of who he is, so they're like, oh, that's the guy. Look, as long as I've been alive, people have tried to point to political figures, religious leaders who are alive saying, oh, that, they're definitely the Antichrist. Well, it usually turns out they're just a really horrible politician, right? Uh, it, it, we've not seen any atrocities like what's going to happen in the seven years of tribulation period. So let's look at a few verses, and these are, I'm going to have most of these up here on the board to give some idea of who the Antichrist is. Now, Paul didn't reveal all of it. He just said, look, there's this guy, bad dude, going to come, Antichrist. So these are some scriptures found in Daniel and Revelation mostly that give us an idea of who the, who the Antichrist is. Scripture says, know your enemy, know who you're dealing with. And here's the thing. Because the Antichrist is a human who's going to be possessed by Satan, it kind of gives us a clue about who Satan is. And what we can look for, and how we can recognize him. So let's look at this. There's five things here that are kind of gives us an idea of who this is. Number one, the peacemaker. In Revelation 6, 1 through 2, it says, Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come, I look, and there was a white horse. And the horseman on it had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he went as a victor to conquer. Now, this is showing the Antichrist as a peacemaker. Now, I've heard some theologians, some pastors say that this is referring to Christ. Now here's the thing, this I believe is referring to the Antichrist who tries to show himself as Christ. He's a false Christ. What does Paul say here? He tries to put himself in the place of God, trying to portray himself as being God. Now look, it's saying he's having a crown, he's a leader, a person of leadership, he's on a white horse, and we'll see later in Revelation that Jesus comes as a conqueror on a white horse. So he's trying to imitate Christ here. Now, if you see where it says that he has a bow, but it doesn't say that he has arrows, a lot of people are saying this is referring to a peace treaty. That he comes with this power, but he comes and other places in Scripture will see that the, the, the Antichrist has this early on peace treaty with the nation of Israel and with Jerusalem. Halfway through that tribulation period, he breaks that peace treaty. We'll see that in a second. So this is the, the Antichrist. He comes, very first thing he does in that seven year tribulation period is brokers bring some kind of peace treaty with Israel, unites pretty much the whole world as portraying himself as a Messiah figure. The second thing what you see is he's a protector in Daniel 24 through 27. We've got a lot of verses here to read. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to wipe away their iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this, from the issuing of the decree to restore and... Uh, Restore Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince of, uh, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt with a plaza and a moat in, a, but in difficult times. After those 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the coming, uh, people of the coming Prince will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with a flood, and until the end there will be war. Desolations are decreed. He will make a firm covenant He'll, uh, with many for one week. But in the midst of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering, and the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decree uh, destruction is poured out on the desolators. Leave that verse, this slide right there. We're talking about the protector. Remember, he makes this peace treaty with Israel, but then he protects God's people. Because he made this peace, peace treaty, he starts protecting them, but only for a short time. That week that it's talking about is not a week of seven days, but a week of seven years. It's talking about that seven-year tribulation period and how he protects them at least during the first part of it. Because then we see in the middle of the week that peace treaty is broken. 
and bad things happen. The third thing I want you to see is that he's a peace breaker. In verse 27, we see that, that at the end of the, or middle of the, the week, that he stops that peace treaty, he breaks that peace treaty, and it's basically the whole world against Israel. And it's going to get ugly for the Jewish people, but also for those who put their trust in Christ during this time period, it's going to be ugly for them. But then won't you see that he becomes a persecutor in Revelation 13, 15 through 17. says, He was permitted to give a spirit to the image of the beast. Talk about the Satan. So that the image of the beast could both speak and cause whoever would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he requires everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on his right hand and his forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, the beast's name or the number of his name. So, we see that he's a persecutor. In that seven-year period, everyone who believes in Christ, everyone who lives will be forced to take this mark in order to buy, sell, just to live your life. If you don't receive this mark, if you don't worship the beast, the, the, the Antichrist, you'll be martyred, whether you're a believer or not. It, it's going to be bloodshed like this world has never known. It's going to be a terrible, horrible situation. And finally, we see this, and this is my favorite part of this. Look at verse Revelation 19 through 11 through 21. Oh, I'm going to turn there because there's a lot of verses to put up there. So, Revelation. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Let me get there. It says this. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. This is where Jesus comes on the white horse. And he judges and makes war in righteousness. His eyes are, were like a fiery flame, and, with many, and many crowns were on his head, and he had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe stained with blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came out of his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will, uh, he will shepherd them with an iron sharp, uh, scepter. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing on the sun, and he cried out in a loud voice, saying to all the birds uh, flying high overhead, Come, gather together for the great super supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of their riders, and the flesh of anyone, both free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast, the king of the earth, and the their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. But the beast was taken prisoner, and along with him the false prophet who had performed the signs in his presence. He deceived those who accept the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image with the signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider of the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So we see that at that end of the seven-year tribulation period, that Jesus comes as a rider on a white horse as a conqueror, and we see that he comes back in vengeance, destroys that Antichrist, destroys the beast and all his minions, his armies, and cast him into the lake of fire. And he becomes a prisoner there. That's good news, guys. Now, we've always heard the saying that, you know, who, who wins? You know, Satan, God, I've read the back of the book. We know God wins. Scripture is teaching us that the beast, the Antichrist, will be the prisoner, will be defeated in the end. So these are just five things about the Antichrist that I want you to know that give you a clue, a glimpse of who he is and what's going to happen. And finally, I want you to see the return of Christ. Verse 8 through 12 says this. 
The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the law, lawless one is based on Satan's working with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders, and with every unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth in order to be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe what is false, so that all will be condemned, those who do not believe the truth but enjoyed unrighteousness. So there's two things I want you to see here about the return of Christ. And this return here that we're speaking of is that return at the end of the seven years. So we had the rapture at the beginning, the return at the end. And when he comes back, he comes as this fierce warrior, as the king of kings, lord of lords. And when he comes back, man, he's going to conquer but listen, there's this judgment. There's a judgment of the Antichrist in verses 8 through 9. We see that the Antichrist, and we saw this in Revelation, that the Antichrist is going to be defeated. There's going to be this battle. It's going to be fierce. And the Antichrist is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And if you've heard about the, the millennium, that's when this takes place. After that, there's this battle. And then the thousand-year reign of Christ. And during that time period, you know what happens? <laughs> the Antichrist, Satan, they're cast into the lake of fire. They're bound there in chains, getting madder and madder. And at the end of that is when we have that battle of Armageddon that everybody knows about and everybody's heard about when it's going to be the battle to end all battles. And then that's it. We are ushered into eternity, into heaven with God to receive our reward. But listen, and I want you to see this. In verse 10 and 12, he focuses on the judgment of the unsaved. This is the part we don't like to talk about. We don't like to think about. Because hell, because separation of God is real. I was talking to a friend of mine, a pastor, a week or so ago, and we were talking about heaven and hell. And uh, once, y'all probably don't remember this sermon, because you probably don't remember many of my sermons, but the title of my sermon is, Everyone Goes to Heaven. And in my sermon, I, I mentioned that everyone will stand before God in judgment, at His seat of His throne of judgment. Everyone, whether good or bad, Christian, non-Christian, everyone will be there. And I believe that's one of the things that makes hell truly hell, is that for that brief second, however long it is, you had that glimpse of what heaven is like. And that will play in your memory, in your life, in your life, in, in your memory, in your mind for all eternity away from God. What it could have been like. And my friend tells me, he goes, hey, you know what? It's funny because that scripture in Revelation where it says that God wipes away all tears. He goes, I truly believe that God is wiping away the memory of anyone you knew who doesn't come to heaven. Because how would heaven be heaven if you were thinking about those people in hell? But that's a good point. And in heaven, we probably won't be cognizant of those loved ones, those people that we knew who didn't accept Christ, who are not in heaven. We're not going to be looking around for them. But I promise, they'll know about you. They'll know where they are. And it's probably going to be every opportunity they had to accept the gospel playing it over and over in their head. Or who knows, maybe every opportunity you had to share the gospel that you missed. God gives us this prophecy of this coming judgment so that we make that decision to know Christ and so that we provide others with that opportunity to know Christ. So that we know that unspeakably horrible things are going to happen and we don't want anyone that we know or love to go through that. I've told you for the past few weeks that the return of Christ is imminent. Nothing else has to happen in prophecy for Jesus to return. Nothing. 
And Jesus said, even he doesn't know the day or the time. Guys, there, there's an urgency. There's an urgency in the gospel. I implore you to tell those people that you love, you care about. Tell them about Christ. Tell them about His saving grace and the love He has for them. Let's pray. God, as we look at these scriptures and we look at the prophecy of the Antichrist, the judgment. I know so many people want to go to church and they want to know about how to biblically take care of their finances. How to live their best life now. But if we don't tell people about Christ and what happens in eternity without Him, I think we're missing the point. God, we need to be reminded of this. We need to think about it every day. Those listening this morning, God, they probably, we probably have our place secure, but we know people who don't, and I pray that you would convict us. Convict us that we need to tell others about the love God has for them and how he doesn't want anyone to go through that judgment. That's the whole point of Jesus coming to the cross. So that we can escape the wrath. God, this morning I pray for your Holy Spirit's power and your moving in our lives. If there's anyone here today who's never received Christ as a Savior, they don't know that they've been forgiven of their sins, that they have a relationship with you, a God who loves them infinitely. Pray that you draw them to yourself. And God, if we have loved ones, people in our families, in our lives, who don't know Christ, that love that you have for them, that relationship you want with them, may you convict us to be able to tell them. And this morning, if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, you don't know that you are saved, I, I want you to come talk to me. I want you to come to this altar or meet me at the back door. Just grab me, take me aside, say, Jason, I don't know. And I don't want to go through that. I want to have that relationship with a God who infinitely loves me more than anything in His creation. So much so that He would die for me. I want you to grab me, take me aside, and I'll show you in Scripture what it means to be saved and how you can place your faith in Christ. Or if you need to pray for someone that God has laid on your heart this morning. God has brought that face to your mind, that name to your mind, and you need to lay them at this altar and give them to Him because you know that they don't know Christ. This altar is open and you can come and I'll pray with you. You can come and pray. And If God's convicted you that you need to share the love of Christ with someone, I want you to pray for them. But do your part. Don't just pray, but tell. Clay. hymn this morning. Let's join together singing a verse of hymn 602. I have decided to follow Jesus. you throughout this week and seriously guys if there's someone you need to share the gospel with look if you it's like I don't know how to share 
Come talk to me. I'll, I'll show you in Scripture. How, I'll show you an easy way to share. The best, most effective way that I've learned is tell somebody how you got saved, why you got saved. That's it. Share your testimony. Paul did it over and over again throughout his ministry. He told people how he got saved. Because when you share what God did for you, that's one of the most powerful things you can do. We have the children's uh, VBS planning meeting and lunch immediately after church. So if you want to stay for that, I think my wife has a big lasagna or two in there. Huh? It's not Cheryl's lasagna, but it's lasagna. And some salad and bread and all that good stuff. So stay. And if you don't plan on being VBS, hey, stay for lunch. She won't know. All right. And then we're going to go pass out some flyers after that. All right. You guys have a blessed week. Clay, you have a song for us. Yeah, let's sing him 195. Y'all all know it. Bless the name of Jesus. Stand with me if you would, please. Bless the name. Be blessed. See you next weekend.